So, um, good evening and welcome to the Park Authority Board meeting for April 29th, 2020. <coughs> I call the meeting to order. I am uh, Bill Bowie, Chairman of the Board. Uh, first, I want to go through some information and long motions that need to be made and information about today's meeting before we can conduct any business. Please be patient while we get through these actions before we get to our agenda. I want to walk you through why we are having an electronic meeting. This is the first time this has ever been done. As this board is aware, on April 14th, the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors enacted an emergency ordinance to establish methods to assure continuity in Fairfax County government and conduct meetings of boards, authorities, commissions, and regional and interjurisdictional public bodies during the novel coronavirus 2019 COVID-19 emergency. In normal times, the Virginia Freedom of Information Act requires that our meetings are fully open to the public and that a physical quorum of members is assembled in one location. In times of emergency, FOIA authorizes meetings to be held wholly electronically if the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble a quorum in a single location. The purpose of the meeting, however, can only be to address the emergency. This board cannot consider other items of business that may be meant necessary to keep the park authority and county parks operating unless they enact this power. In addition for such electronic meetings, public access to the meeting must be arranged, but, the, but allowing the public to be physically present is not required. The continuity in government ordinance for county boards, authorities, and, com and commissions anticipated the circumstances in which we now find ourselves. The nature of this COVID-19 emergency makes it unsafe to physically assemble this board. It is unsafe for the public to attend our meetings in person. And there are essential functions and services that must occur to assure continuity in the park authority and the county parks. As you know, our governor has ordered that until June 10th, Individuals within the Commonwealth are to remain in their homes, may not gather in groups of greater than 10, and has ordered the closure of certain businesses. This is this remarkable and unprecedented situation that warrants my determination to employ emergency ordinance that the Board of Supervisors adopted on April 14th. I turn to this tool with the full intention to make our meetings as open and transparent as possible, but with equal determination to ensure that the vital function of parks continue. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance, this board needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's a bit cumbersome, so I ask you in advance for your patience. During our meeting, if you wish to be recognized, please raise your hand. And when I recognize you, please say your name. This will ensure that you are recognized and the public knows who is speaking. If you intend to vote nay or abstain on any item, we will need to do a roll call on those votes. Audibility of members' voices. First, the audibility of members' voices. Because each member of this board is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all other members to be able to hear. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close, close attention to
to ensure that you can hear each one of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member's voice. We will go alphabetically following the vice chair. So here's the roll. Vice Chairman Quincy. Ken Quincy and I am participating in my residence in the Providence District. Dr. Adu. Participating in my residence, oops. Yeah, in my residence in Lee District. Dr. Carter. This is Cynthia Jacobs Carter, and I am participating from my residence in Lee District. Maggie Godbold. Hi, this is Maggie Godbold, and I am participating from my residence in the Sully District. Linwood Gorham. Participating from my residence in the Mount Vernon District. Tim Hackman. Tim, can't hear you. Tim? This is Maggie Godbold. Tim, you need to unmute. There you go. Tim, okay. yes. now I'm unmuted. I, uh, I'm Tim Hackman. I'm participating from my residence in the Drainsville District. Okay. Ron Kendall. Uh, this is Ron Kendall. I'm participating from my residence in Mason District. Faisal Khan. Participating from my residence in Providence District. Kyle Stone. This is Kyle Stone. I'm participating from my residence in Braddock District. Michael Thompson. It's Mike Thompson participating from my residence in Springfield District. James Zook. Participating from my residence in Springfield District. And I'm Bill Bowie, and I'm participating from my residence in the Hunter Mill District. Okay, at this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to Vice Chairman Quincy so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. I move that each board member's voice may be adequately heard by each other board member. You have heard the motion, is there a second? Mike Thompson seconds the motion. It has been moved and seconded. Is there a discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Mr. Chairman, that motion passes. Thank you, Ken. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically what type of electronic communications is being used and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this board to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such, FOIA's usual requirements, which require the physical assembly of this board and the physical nature, physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this board may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video conference and that the public may access this meeting by a simultaneous live video streaming or by calling into the telephone number that has been properly noticed. It is so moved. The motion, is there a second? Abonnez two seconds. Okay, is there a discussion? Being and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Mr. Chairman, the motion has passed. Thank you, sir. Finally, it is next required that all matters addressed on today's agenda 
must address the state of emergency itself are necessary for continuity in Fairfax government, Fairfax, Fairfax County government, or both. Finally, I move that the Park Authority certify that all matters on today's agenda address the state of emergency itself are necessary for continuity in the Fairfax County government or both. It is so moved. You have heard the motion. Is there a second? Mike Thompson seconds the motion. Is there a discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Mr. Chairman, that motion carries. Thank you, Vice Chairman Quincy. Now that the preliminary matters are complete, this is a historic time. And I certainly want to thank you for your patience and all the communication during this time. It's, it's really, really crazy. But now we can begin the meeting. There will be no public comment at this meeting, but the public is with us via the live streaming application. All right. Wide admin item number one is the adoption of the March 11th, 2020 Park Authority Board meeting minutes. Mike? Okay, Mike Thompson seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. <coughs> Wide admin item number two is the adjustment to the Park Authority board schedule for the remainder of fiscal year 2020. Mike Thompson seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Kyle, did you raise your hand? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Motion item countywide. Uh, action item one, approval of the 2020 park bond category allocations. Dave Bowden, Director of Planning and Development. Uh, Welcome. The Park Authority Board, uh, the Park Authority Executive Director recommends that the Park Authority Board approve the percent distribution of the $100 million 2020 park bond into the following categories. Natural and cultural resource stewardship at 12%, land acquisition and open space preservation at 7%, park renovation and upgrades at 53%, and new park development at 28%. Board action is requested on April 29, 2020, to support the public information process for the 2020 bond resolution. Uh, as most of you are familiar, uh, we have a on the referendum for this fall in November, there is a $112 million park bond with the Board of Supervisors adoption of the FY 2020 improvement program, which will actually happen on May 12th now because of COVID. That bond will be allocated as $100 million to the Fairfax County Park Authority and $12 million to the regional park authority. Uh, through discussions held at the Park Authority Board Budget and Finance Policy and Budget Committee meetings over the last few months, We've come up with a general allocation of bond funds uh, in the categories that I mentioned. And uh, Hannah has the presentation. Next slide, Hannah. Dave Bowden again. Uh, as you can see in this uh, pie chart here, this shows the actual breakdown of the uh, uh, previous slide, please, Hannah. This uh, shows the actual breakdown that we've discussed in the committee meetings uh, for land acquisition, new park development, park renovations and upgrades, and natural cultural resource stewardship. So you can actually see the dollars that are associated with those percentages. Next slide. Hannah, next slide, please. Uh, to give you a quick comparison to the 2016 bond, which was an $87.7 million park bond. As you can see, the percentages are almost exactly equal for the uh, categories. We have a little uh, uptick there in natural and culture resource stewardship, uh, a little less in park uh, a little less in uh, new park development, and a little less in land acquisition in the 2020 bond. Uh, last slide, please, Hannah. 
So just going forward, this is actually the Board of Supervisors and the county process to get the uh, bond on the actual uh, ballot in November 2020. Uh, if you approve the category allocations uh, this evening, uh, we will uh, look for the uh, in May here, uh, uh, in the second week in May, when the BOS authorizes the bond amount as part of the budget approval. Once that uh, that's done in June, the BOS will adopt a resolution for the bond referenda. In July, the county attorney's office will secure legal approval to place the bond on the November 2020 bell. Uh, in September, the Board of Supervisors will approve the plain English bell. <coughs> uh, and in October, the county mails out the bond pamphlets to county households, which will actually, uh, there's attachment to your board item, which uh, explains a little bit about each of the categories. That's what will actually go out in the pamphlet to the county household. And on November 2020, we'll all vote if we're in Fairfax County, and afterwards we will celebrate another win for our bond program. And with that, I'll open it back up to Mr. Bowie for questions. Very good. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, any, uh, any discussion, any questions? Just raise your hand if you've got a question. Okay. Seeing that there are no questions, uh, is there a motion? Is there a second to the motion to approve the bond categories? I'll make the motion to approve the bond category allocations as stated. That was Ken Quincy. Ken Quincy. This is Mike. This is Mike Thompson, and I second the motion. Any other discussion, folks? Okay. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Countywide action item number two is the approval of the capital construction project scopes, contract awards requiring reallocation of capital funding, submission of grant applications and real estate leases during COVID-19 emergency. I think Dave's got another presentation. Authorization for the executive uh, director and or deputy directors to approve capital construction project scopes, contract awards requiring reallocation of capital funding, submission of grant applications, and real property leases due to constraints caused by an emergency or disaster declared by the governor or the board of supervisors. Uh, the recommendation, the Park Authority executive director recommends that the Park Authority board authorize the executive director and or deputy directors to approve capital construction project scopes, contract awards requiring reallocations of capital funding, submission of grant applications, and real property leases due to constraints caused by an emergency or disaster declared by the governor or board of supervisors. A board action is requested tonight on April 29th to avoid impact to project schedules. This is really an administrative process for the uh, items that you have been stated that you would typically come to the board for approval. Uh, at times, it may be necessary to move forward capital development projects, grant applications, leases, or uh, due to the emergency disaster declared by the governor and board of supervisors, rather than wait till the board reconvenes. If this happens, the board will be notified of any of those actions at the next board meeting. And I would just say that we typically would do this. We used to do this in August when the board was in recess, when we used to bring uh, all the capital construction contracts to both the Park Authority Board for approval and the county uh, the board of supervisors including all the county agencies and both uh, the park authority board and the board of supervisors would take an action while they were on recess to allow their executive directors and the county executive to approve these types of uh, awards uh and and leases and, and such while the board was in recess so with that said i'll take questions uh chairman Bowie. okay yeah linwood so will this Linwood, you gotta please state your name. I'm sorry, yeah, this is Linwood Gorm. Um, is this going to be the practice or is it only gonna be done when it's necessity? Um, in other words, it has to be decided before the next time we meet electronically or in person. So is is it gonna become the is it the norm for now or is it just for basically emergency action? 
The motion calls for it. This is Bill Bowie. The motion calls for it to be an action during the COVID-19 emergency. Michael. And so as I understand that in Linwood, okay. I state your name. This is, this is Mike Thompson, um, Linwood, as I understand it, this would mean that during this crisis, regardless of us holding meetings, they would have the ability to move these forward. And as soon as the crisis is lifted, it would go back to its normal course. If it's not a necessity, why would we need to do it? I, I'm completely in support of something, you know, if it's an emergency, if it's really necessary, but it is pretty easy for us to approve these in these emergency board meetings. Uh, why would it need to be all actions and not just ones that really needed to be handled timely? Mr. Bowie, this is Kirk Kincannon, the Executive Director of the Park Authority, if I may speak. Sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bowie. Uh, uh, just uh, a precaution is what we are putting in place, given that we might have to act quickly related to actions by the Board of Supervisors that might preclude the board uh, meeting on its schedule of once a month or twice a month, depending on the meeting. Uh, we do not intend to take this liberally. These will only be taken in actions where we absolutely cannot pull the board together. It just gives us the opportunity to be flexible and to react to things that might come up as a result of either federal funding, state funding, um, that would be support of the uh, county's efforts to um, deal with the uh, emergency at hand. This is Linwood again. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Great. Yeah, we've actually done this the last two years in the month of August to, to carry us over. Okay. Is there any other discussion of this matter? Okay, this is Ken Quincy. I would move to authorize the executive director and or the deputy directors to approve capital construction projects, scopes, contract awards requiring reallocation of capital funding, submission of grant applications, and real property leases due to the constraints caused by an emergency or disaster declared by the governor or board of supervisors. This is Mike Thompson and I second the motion. Is there any other dis discussion of this item? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 <coughs> motion carries. All right, action item number three in the Mason District. This is scope approval for the Annandale Community Park renovation and expansion of the Hidden Oaks Nature Center. Uh, this is Ron Kendall, and I'd like to make a motion to approve this. Mike Thompson, and I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on this matter? If there's none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Thank you. Action item number four, scope approval in the Mason District, the Annandale Community Park Tennis Court Lighting Replacement. This is uh, Ron Kendall. I'd like to make a motion to move this forward. In Quincy, I second the motion. Is there any discussion? Been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Thank you. In the Lee District, action item number five is scope approval of the Who's Park Athletic Field Lighting. Dr. Carter, you're on mute. I have lost my uh, screen. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. We can also see you. See you too. That's good. I can't see you. Uh, I said that uh, this is Cynthia Jacobs Carter, and I make a motion that we approve. And this is Maggie Godbold, and I'd like to second the motion. Is there any discussion of the matter? 
Seeing that there's none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All, opposed, all opposed say nay. Motion carries. Action item number six in the Springfield District, scope approval, Burke Lake Park picnic shelters. This is Mike Thompson and I move to approve the Burke Lake picnic shelters. This is Tim Hackman and I second the motion. Is there any discussion of the motion? Seeing that there's none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Action item number seven in the Drainsville District, the Area One Maintenance Facility Replacement Reallocation of Funds from the Construction Contract Award, for the Construction Contract Award. This is Tim Hackman, and I move to reallocate funds for the construction of the Area 1 maintenance facility. This is Mike Thompson, and I second the motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing that there's none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The motion carries. Okay, information item number one. Why is the FY20 budget update impacts of the COVID-19 with a presentation. So at this point, we'll turn it over to Mike Baird and Cindy Walsh to present the board item. Good evening, this is Cindy Walsh. I'm here for the presentation. I suspected we're not any different than the rest of the world and we're feeling uh, quite a bit of a pandemic. So tonight, Mike Baird and I will be providing information on the specifics can you go to the next slide, please, Hannah? Thanks, Cindy. Mike Baird here. What we wanted to kind of present to the board on this slide is kind of what the Park Authority looked like uh, in the, the third quarter before COVID-19 kind of set in. On the revenue side, you can kind of see revenues are up about $1.1 million. Expenditures were down about $2.4 million. So the overall posture of the revenue fund, at the end of March, we were about, about $3.5 million, better off than we were last year. We have a couple bullets down there that I wanted to bring attention to that would help this stuff. And we had some great spending controls and attention to the bottom line, we're paying off. And actually, too, all this performance is good, we actually think it would have been better uh, if it had not been for COVID because some of our facilities started closing March 16th. So really the revenue at that point shut off. And we also started processing some refunds even before that date, but we started processing some refunds and that really negatively impacted revenue. So this position would have been even better uh, had not been for COVID-19. And I will just mention too that FY, uh, 23rd quarter will be coming to the board also in uh, May. Next slide, please. Cindy, I think you need to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, as quickly as this virus hit us, it's as quickly as where our impacts began. As you can see at the top of this slide that our customer cancellation started in March, in early March, and went through the 15th. And during that time period, we ended at $280,000 from down the same week of uh, the prior year. The other thing that happened starting March 16th when we closed these facilities, of course, we had a lot of cancellations and refunds starting, people starting to panic a little bit. They wanted their money back on classes and camps, events and services, but also in some cases they wanted to freeze their passes or get their money back on passes. The other thing that um, impacts us financially is that we continue to invest in our employees. So every county employee per county direction has been paid throughout this uh, COVID-19 and that includes all of our E and G, or, which are our seasonal staff, as well as all of our merit staff. And then of course, we have a lot of new expenses now. We have cleaning supplies and personal protective equipment and signage is just some of the things that we've experienced so far. Next slide, please. 
So here's what we know, or what we don't know, sorry. What we don't know right now is what the impact of limiting groups is going to be. Everyone knows that limit right now is, is supposed to be 10. We also have the six foot distancing requirements, which we don't know how that impact will be for us. Um, right now, the CDC is telling the public that it's not a good idea to go to water parks, to spas and to saunas. So we're not quite sure yet how we'd open these safely. We're, we're working on that. Um, we not, we're not sure that some of these small businesses who provide our camps are going to be able to provide camps this summer. We also don't know yet from the schools whether or not they're going to allow us in the schools for our camps and our programs. And that's a huge impact for us, which we'll hear about in a second. Um, we also don't know about attendance and the fears that people are experiencing right now because of this virus, whether or not they'll join us for camps, classes, or for even participation in our rec centers. And then finally, we're wondering if there's going to be a continued request for camp refunds, although we suspect after uh, some of these kids have been in the household for quite some time, the parents may be wanting to uh, use us for our camps this summer. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, Kyle, do you have a question? Yes, this is Kyle Stone. Cindy, going back to two or three slides ago, you had mentioned staff is still getting paid. How do we anticipate that continuing for, and for how long? Kirk, do you want to handle that question? This is Kirk Kincannon, Executive Director of the Fairfax County Park Authority. Um, at this time, the county has authorized six weeks of administrative leave for uh, closed uh, staff affected by closed facilities or direct impact by the COVID related to their family or their health. Uh, there are also regulations that have put into effect by the federal government related to up to 12 weeks of FML leave related to uh, COVID uh, impacts. Uh, in addition, the county has also put together another program related to kind of a catch basin fail safe um, where staff are unable to um, find work or find positions uh, in the county. More details on that, I believe, can be found on the, on the county website. Um, those are all costs that are currently being borne by the park authority as well as the county. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the presentation. Okay. Linwood, you have a question? I do, uh, related to the costs of, you know, the additional costs that I, I, I see uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID causing. Um, as we slowly start to open things back up, uh, and of course there's been talk about uh, the, uh, the farmer's markets uh, and the garden uh, plots and stuff like that at this point, I assume, you know, shortly there behind them will be the parking lots for some of the, uh, passive recreation areas and, and things like that. Um, I'm assuming that we're gonna have to have people supervising this, or I guess it's a question, who will supervise that people maintain the proper social distancing and uh, you know, follow the directive uh, by the governor? And we're, are we likely to incur costs for that? Mr. Chairman, this is Kirk Cannon, Executive Director of the Park Authority. Uh, Mr. Linwood, uh, at this time, um, we are uh, looking to be extremely flexible related to reopening the remainder of the system. There are discussions right now. Um, some of it depends on contract adjustments and negotiations related to our vendor for golf on opening um, a handful of the golf courses beginning on May 8th and then uh, continuing to open them up through the remainder of the season. Um, related to parking lots and other areas, uh, we really are keeping an eye on um, what, what the health department is sharing with us, which is a continuing increase of COVID-related cases at this time. Um, and at this point in discussions with the county executive and other county uh, leaders on the senior management team, um, there is no push to reopen the county as a whole at this time related to um, the impacts of the COVID because we are still in a situation um, that we are trying to reduce large public gatherings. Um, while we have the parking lots closed, we know that they continue, but we have reduced our park visitation across the board by about 60 to 70%. Although we know our trails are being used and people are in the parks, um, the overall use of the parks has decreased significantly based on the data that's been collected by staff. Related to monitoring the parks, 
uh, staff that were pre previously in rec centers and, and in other situations in the Park Authority are now being used related to monitoring the COVID um, situation within the parks. Uh, we are asking staff at this point to, uh, when they see large gatherings, to indicate to the groups that they are to disperse uh, and move along, um, but they are not police. So we are not asking them to enforce that in a manner other than a verbal uh, uh, recognition that the group needs to social distance and to move along. Staff then takes a note of that information, provides it in their daily reports to us. Um, we share that information uh, with the police and the police are also working with us actively um, in situations that require their uh, assistance. Thank you, Kurt. This is Linwood again. Um, as far as the demand for the parks right now and the, the mental health benefits that open parks can help, especially the passive areas, I don't know uh, if we're hearing a lot from the public uh, about that right now, but I can tell you from what I witness uh, near where I li live uh, with the Bureau of Land Management and the state parks, which are open, they're having to close the parking lots at those two facilities just because of capacity. So certainly there's absolutely de demand and want for those things. And, uh, you know, I hope, I think as many uh, have, have talked about as the temperature goes up, the virus would uh, uh, die faster and it would become safer uh, to social distance in our parks uh, uh, coming up in the summer season. Okay. Okay. You, you wanna continue? Yes, sir, thank you. Anna, can you please go to slide five? Thank you. Uh, slide five, one more back. They're, they're numbered, thank you. So here's what we know um, so far that have been the impact on our financial picture will be the impact. These are known things for us. Um, we already refunded 2.15 million in the spring for our classes and camps that we canceled. Our water mine revenue on general, uh, on average on a weekly basis brings $150,000 a year. Our typical week of camp revenue is $800,000. Our typical week of golf revenue is $285,000. We know that we will have a significant decrease in camp revenue without school use, as well as we wouldn't be able to host rec pack in those schools, as well as uh, summer programs. We also know that our current value of the registered summer camp program is $4.1 million. That right now is where we have money sitting in the bank but it's a total of an $8 million operation. We also know that Rec Center Spring Membership Sale, it typically brings in $1.6 million a year. So we've passed that already. Um, we're looking at other sale opportunities for the future. But we, um, one of the things that's very startling here is our fourth quarter is always our profitable quarter. It's 32, 35% of our revenue for the year. And that last year brought in $16.5 million. And then again, on the staffing cost here, the pandemic leave so far, and this is leave that folks have been able to take um, because of the virus has cost us in seasonal staff alone 1.7, 1.07 million. And then merit staff cost for the leave has been 164,000 to date. Next slide, please. Here's where the big numbers come in. Um, if you take a look at the top there, the title, and the, it is golf opening on May 8th. Hopefully we'll have good weather that day. And then all else would be open on June 10th. That's the scenario that we've created, created here for you to see financially what that impact would look like. If you look to the right there down in the part that's highlighted, this would put us um, at a $8.3 million deficit at the end of the fiscal year if these conditions below the impacts to date occur. At this point, we've already lost eight weeks of golf. Our rec center passes remain on hold. You know, folks are still not obviously able to go to the rec centers. We've already canceled, as I said, our spring classes, camps, and our events. We are hoping that we'd be able to proceed with some modified camps and classes, but we have no idea right now because of the limited uh, space and the dis distance constraints, as well as being able to open. We still have our managed parks on hold and the amusements that are in those managed parks. 
We don't see a decrease and uh, we do a de see a decrease in non-essential expenses, but we have an increase in safety expenses and we don't see any salary changes at this point. So this is one scenario. I'll take you to the next one. Next slide, please. Our next slide, as you can see, gets a little worse. It still has golf opening next week and or May 8th. I guess that's two weeks from now. I've lost track of dates, sorry. Um, and everything else opening on July 1st. Again, draw your attention, please, to the highlighted area. At that point, we would have been a $9.5 million deficit. And all the things that I stated above still apply, except in this circumstance, we would have the water mine closed, or this number would um, is the part of that number. Our summer camps and programs would be delayed for three weeks and we would be run, running activities on a limited basis due to those space constraints. And that might mean that if we have a 10 person limit and social distancing in place, we may have nine kids in camp and one counselor, as an example. And then of course that again is with our managed parks and amusements still on hold. And then the third scenario, if you could turn to the next slide, please, Hannah, is a fall opening. Let's say that golf still opens on May the 8th and we don't open anything until the fall on September 1st timeframe. We're then looking at a $13 million deficit for just by 20. This is assuming the same things as above, but it also now at this point is assuming that all of our summer classes are closed or canceled and our camps and our water mine is closed. And then we've kept, kept our managed parks and amusements closed. These assumptions are really just um, you know, our knowledge right now, given the knowns and the unknowns that you've seen above. Hannah, can you please go to the next slide? Thank you, Hannah. Mike Baird here. Uh, we just kind of went over a couple of the scenarios there. And what we wanted to do now is provide the board with a couple options that we have at our disposal to help ourselves. And some of these we'd be requesting to possibly bring to the board in May uh, for your review and approval. Uh, the first option that we have here is a revenue and operating fund stabilization reserve. The current balance in that reserve, as you can see there, is $2.6 million. Uh, this reserve is set up kind of for this purpose, you know, set up for cash flow and emergencies. And you know, we are certainly in that situation. The Park Authority Board did take action back in September to allow up to 100% use of this current reserve. Uh, and then bottom, the recommendation would be to bring this to the board in May for approval to use up to the current total amount of the $2.6 million. Next slide, Kyle, please. Kyle, Kyle, you have a question? Kyle Stone. Open May 8th, is that something we've committed to? Kirk Cantanen, Executive Director, Park Authority. Uh, Kyle, at this point, we are um, attempting to work through some contract issues related to golf and being able to uh, move more fully into credit card prepay. Um, so we're hopeful that that can be addressed and that we look towards moving towards uh, to opening. Uh, I believe um, the three golf courses, uh, Greendale, Burke Lake, and Laurel Hill initially, and then over time opening the remainder of the courses, um, dependent on whether or not we can get personal protective equipment that will allow the safe operation, uh, that we will able to build a uh, front desk that will um, help with the um, um, uh, location of patrons as well as staff and trying to keep them separated via plexiglass while we take payments or make sales. Uh, and then also a lot of it's dependent on any actions that may be taken in the future related to the governor um, who did not shut down golf, but he did shut down um, the ability to use clubhouses. So all that's in consideration, I would say at this time, uh, relative to trying to meet that May 8th target date for those three courses noted. And a next slide, please. The next option that we have here is looking at the FY 2020 telecom revenues and what we estimate this 
to be is about $687,000. And this would be the value of all revenue earned on all the monopoles during FY 2020. It's important to note that none of these revenues have been appropriated yet, so no projects would be impacted. So what we would recommend in May is to bring an action item to transfer all the revenue earned in FY 20 into the park revenue and operating fund. Next slide, please. What this one, what this reserve is, the park revenue capital sinking fund, and this one has a balance of about seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. The rules in this before have been set up really for long-term life cycle capital improvements. Uh, back in June 2019, the board take uh, action to expand the use and include purchase of capital equipment. What we would request to do may is come to the board in May to expand the use of this to, in, to include unplanned emergency situations such as a COVID-19 and would allow us to maybe use it for operating expenses to help the revenue fund. Next slide, please. And then Kirk is actually going to touch on this slide. Thank you, Mike. Kirk and Cannon, Executive Director of the Fairfax County Park Authority. So we are in a situation where we are in flux. There are no certain dynamics other than we're going through the COVID-19 virus at this time. Uh, what we have presented tonight are really uh, multiple options and anywhere along the scenario of best case to worst case, um, probably more towards uh, the higher end is what we're seeing now based on the increase and in rise in COVID related to a net loss in the revenue fund. Uh, we are continuing to assess any alternative funding sources that we have within the park authority um, and working with the county to try to address those shortfalls using existing funds that are not normally part of the board's um, uh, prerogative. And a lot of these rest in uh, the, the general fund. Um, for example, a, a number of years ago during a significant budget cut, we move a moved a number of positions out of the general fund into the revenue fund. Some of those actions we have started taking uh, recently to move positions back into the general fund from the revenue fund that were historically part of the general fund. So those are the things that we're talking about. We're also looking about other um, WPFO, so work performed by others where we would be able to charge to funds that have a large surplus uh, in relation to uh, staffing. For instance, um, the Vulcan fund, which is deals with the Colchester uh, reserve area. Um, historically, we had not been charging staff to that. Uh, until recently, and so there are some uh, abilities to charge staff that deal with that particular project to that fund and then save uh, general fund dollars that could absorb uh, additional staff uh, related to, um, again, the historical use of general fund staff who were in the revenue fund. We're also working with you all, and that's why we presented these numbers tonight to give you an idea of what we have available at the board's discretion uh, in, in conjunction with our work that will happen with Fairfax County government. We've been in conversations with the county almost since day one, uh, six or seven weeks ago, as we, as we knew we would end up with some level of net loss. And as I said, um, on the higher spectrum, it is significant. Uh, the memo that I provided to you some weeks ago indicated that with certain actions related to the board, Park Authority Board, and also actions taken by uh, our uh, staff and our um, internal general fund abilities, we might be able to lessen that net loss to about four to $5 million. Um, we are in continuing conversations with the county. I'm in conversations with Joe Mondoro and Christina Jackson, the CFO with the county, about trying to work with uh, the park authority uh, to uh, talk about things like we had a couple of years ago when we had the significant rainfalls and we um, secured about a $2 million uh, bridge loan from the county that we actually paid back that same year because of our um, good work internally and the great weather that we had where we actually did not need that $2 million. The county is aware of our situation. There are a number of uh, areas within the county that are not meeting revenue targets that are similar to us. Um, and so there are significant shortfalls in the county relative to the non-tax based funds 
fee-based funds um, that are typically garnered by the county. Um, we are a, again, a uh, through our MOU in partnership with the county to um, work with them and use their administrative functions and budget functions, and that work continues. Um, what I wanted to share again tonight was we are really uncertain at where we will end up. Um, the impact of the six weeks of administrative leave was not um, anticipated at the beginning of our uh, reviews uh, four or five weeks ago. That's an additional expense that we've had to uh, absorb, um, and we will continue to work with the county and, and, and lobby the county to uh, get them hopefully to pay for those expenses to the revenue and operating fund. There are many, many things that are in play right now relative to um, the county uh, opening businesses back up, the impact to the county requirements to meet certain criteria from the governor's perspective, health related perspective. Um, the key word that we have been using in the last many weeks is flexibility and the ability to literally dance from one game board to the next with different pieces and not knowing which pieces you have. So I think that um, we are working hard. You have a great team working on this, and we will entertain any questions at this moment. Very good. All right, is that the last of the discussion? Are there any board members that have any other items that they'd like to talk about? Uh, Ron? Timing. And to be sure that uh, the park authority and the county level is actually coordinating whatever we're doing with the other jurisdictions, because if we open a week before everybody else, we're going to get buried in people. And if we open a week later, they're gonna get buried by our people because we have such close borders. Mr. Chairman, Kirk Kincannon, if I may speak. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kendall. That's a great point. And one thing that I did want to bring up, we have been coordinating regionally almost since day one of this COVID event. Um, we actually, uh, even at the national level, began discussions the first week into COVID. And, and Sarah and I participated in a national call where we spoke and got to list, uh, talk to and hear from the, the director in New York City, um, the director in, in the Seattle area, Chicago, um, other areas in the county that were experiencing COVID uh, significantly earlier than we were experiencing it. Since that time frame, we have participated in other regional calls with our neighbors and our neighboring jurisdictions, including the National Park Service uh, conversation with the uh, superintendent of the GW Parkway, um, Chuck Cuvier. So uh, even at the national level, and regional level, we are working to try to coordinate our openings. Um, they, uh, we did that as we shut the systems down. We had those conversations with uh, all the towns, uh, cities within Fairfax County, as well as uh, Leesburg, Loudoun County, Prince William County, Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority. Those conversations continue. Uh, as a matter of fact, Sarah and I will be on a, a teleconference tomorrow with the Regional Park Authority, Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority, and Prince William uh, County, and uh, we hope that Arlington and Alexandria and other jurisdictions will join us, but to talk about uh, things like golf and then the impacts that the state parks are having that was noted by um, one of the members tonight and looking at um, kind of forward looking at uh, making sure that we do in fact coordinate when we reopen the system uh, based on uh, health requirements and health documents that we're privy to and are provided that everybody can pull up on the VDH site uh, in consideration of all of those uh, items. We wanna make sure that we uh, protect our residents and also um, do the things that are good for health. Mike Thompson. This is Mike Thompson. <clears throat> Kirk, um, I mean, to a certain extent, we're already coordinating with, with other areas in that, I mean, for example, with golf, the state has stayed open and you know i've talked about this a little bit but i i think we need to lean into how we can how we can do things to especially as it gets warmer to make outdoor activity recognizing the need for social distancing and stuff 
accessible to folks that we we have we have spent years talking and promoting the the mental health benefits of parks the the impact that that parks have and and we don't we don't when we measure that we don't talk about what's the distance from a community to a trail but to a park where there's open space and people are able to do some things i recognize that that we have to balance that but i think that when especially when we're talking about areas that the state or others have opened we need to be as as generous as we can with our explanation to the public as to why we are why we are making a different decision different than the state different than maybe prince william county or, or another county and whether it's farmer markets or I mean, even like the district of columbia from what i understand a lot of its open table farmer markets are now using open table and allowing people to to book opportunities to come visit, and all those and and a, a lot, if not all, those farmer markets I've been told are open. I think we need to to be innovative, and and use technology where we can, but but also lean in a little bit. That if it's okay for the state to open something, we should we, the default should be we should open it unless there's a defined reason not to that we can explain to folks. So, Mike, I've had a number of those conversations with with uh, Kirk over the past, you know, six or seven weeks. And that's Bill Bowie speaking. That is Bill Bowie speaking. Thank you, Michael. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've asked Kirk to do uh, in support of what you're saying is to go back to the county attorney and find out if we open these facilities what kind of liability are we opening ourselves up to in case that there is a spread that can be traced back to one of our parks because we open it? And so I don't know where Kirk is on that, but that's a very, very concerning thing for me uh, in terms of the decisions that we make. Kirk? Mike, Mike you want to respond first? Yeah, just real quick. I I completely understand that and get that. And I also think that we should be sure to work with our federal delegation um, as they work through the different liability issues and legislation that's being considered um, just because of those exact issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Kirk Kincan, Executive Director of the Park Authority. I think one of the things first and foremost that we uh, owe to our, not only to our residents, but to our staff is to ensure they have the proper protective equipment. That is one of the things that we've had a had a significant issue with related to, I think the county as a whole initially um, was was um, struggling to get the, the amount of PPE that was needed given the crisis. Um, and as this thing grew, um, we are low on the totem pole related to uh, healthcare, uh, police, fire, um, doctors uh, that are working in the health department, the uh, CSB folks that are dealing with frontline COVID issues in the face. Uh, so those folks got the personal protective equipment. And, and so for us to um, put our staff in a situation of potential hazard or danger, um, we had a number of staff who took advantage of the COVID leave because they had child care issues or they had parental issues that they were dealing with elder care. Um, and then as we got further into the situation, we had staff who, in fact, um, were uh, presumed presumptive and had to exit from work. So it's, it is an across the board uh, reduction in the availability of staff, number one. Uh, I think just in maintenance, we're down about 35% of our maintenance crews. Um, and from the perspective of other staff who have stepped out because of the issues um, we're probably down another 20 or 30 percent in some of those other issues. So it's not just a matter from our perspective of being able or, or opening up and wanting to open up. It's a matter of sometimes having the resources to protect staff to open up. And then, frankly, in some cases, because of the ages of many of our staff, many of our staff are uh, in the age of uh, where we should be cons concerned about their impact. And so they are not in many cases coming to work, they're self-quarantining because of the age. And so for golf, for instance, we have a number of staff in golf that are over 60. Um, and so from the perspective of protection of staff, we had to take those situations. 
Um, back to a coordinated effort, um, golf was coordinated, the park closures were coordinated with Prince William, Arlington County, uh, Northern Virginia Regional Parks. Everybody on that conference agreed to close parks. Um, most agreed to close parking lots. Everybody that had golf courses, we shut the golf courses down. Um, but we are also in discussions about reopening those now that we have a better understanding and in fact have the tools and resources available to us. Absolutely. This is totally contrary to my belief in parks, in re restricting people from parks. But we took these actions based on what we had seen in New York City and in Seattle and other areas out west and in the Midwest where these actions were not taken. And so they saw significant increases in their COVID numbers and didn't take these actions until well late in the game. And I, from working with the health department, got the support, county attorney's support. So we, this was not taken lightly, uh, obviously, uh, pulling these resources from the community. What we hope to do now is coordinate and start beginning to return those resources like we have today with the opening of the community gardens and as we roll out the farmer's market beginning uh, the May 9th timeframe and then golf from that point and then taking a look at where we are related to mass gatherings in the COVID, um, the ability for the community to self-police themselves and self-distance related to social distancing. Interesting conversation I had with uh, the GW president, uh, superintendent yesterday uh, on the National Park Service. What they're finding at a national level is that where they have controls like we currently have, they're seeing self-control and social distancing run at about 69 or 70 percent in their parks. Where they are now removing those controls at the state or national or local level, and it's just social distance, there's no requirement, they're seeing almost a 20 percent drop in two days. So that's part of what we're looking at too, is if we pull too early, if we come out of the shoot too early, we will certainly be part of why COVID goes up and we have to consider that as well. Are there any other, uh, any other questions or discussions, Linwood? This is Linwood Gorham. Um, one of the things that uh, really I thought guided us uh, in the beginning, uh, and certainly it was appropriate that it does guide us, uh, is the guidance from the governor. Um, and uh, he basically wanted everything shut down. At this point, though, it, it appears that the state parks, at least the ones I'm familiar with, didn't close. Um, I'd love for us to get some good, firm information on whether they did or they didn't. And if they didn't close, how they're rationalizing staying open. Uh, I think that could have uh, an effect on these liability issues that we talk about that unfortunately, of course, are real today. Um, but in coordinating with um, all the other agencies around and opening together, it appears that, that the state parks uh, and again, the Bureau of Land Management are open right now. Uh, and, and I only witnessed that just from the, 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 the use that uh, is happening with those. So I'd, I'd love to know that in fact, for sure, the state park is open, and if so, how they uh, justified and rationalized that with the governor's uh, guidance. This is Bill Bowie. One, one of the things that, that really, really scares the heck out of me is any, any regard to opening up a playground, which is nothing but a Petri dish, and that's what concerns me um, so much. And uh, trying to be, I'm, and there's no way we can control anything in a playground. We can't have staff there. There's just too many. They're spread out. Um, so without a, a real education to the public about you know what this means, um, there there's a substantial risk there. So I'm trying to do it on the side of caution. Anybody else, Michael? Just, just real quick on that note, I, I agree with you, but I, I know that throughout the county, I recognize the issue. I mean, out my back, out the back of my house, I can see an elementary school playground, and and I can see through the woods. Though there's more leaves now than there was when this all started. All the kids out there playing, 
and, and, and that kind of stuff. But I know that at least at state parks, for example, where there are playgrounds, they're simply, they're, they're putting a sign up and putting a, a kind of a don't cross thing on and just saying, you know, the, the playground is closed to, to Linwood's point. I just, I just, I think, I think that one of the issues we, is that when a resident can go to one park, that's a state park and do something, but the county park, they can't, we just, we just have to be proactive in our message at a minimum, be proactive in our messaging, explaining why. Um, also, and it, this may not be happening all over the county, though I think it's happening in some other areas, you know, places like Burke Lake, we're getting hundreds of cars parking on, on 123 and driving into neighborhoods. And all those folks are walking into the theoretically closed park and using the trails and using the, the picnic shelters and, and doing some stuff. So I, I, I know we're not fully stopping the activity. I just, I just think we've got to figure out how to balance and deal with, with the ripple effect of all this. Anybody else? Kyle? Yeah, this, this is Kyle Stone. Two quick questions, Kirk, on your uh, memo uh, related to the gardens and farmers markets. Um, why those three farmers markets as opposed to any of the other ones we've got? And then how close are we to being able to accept SNAP benefits at them? Kirk and Cannon, Executive Director, thank you for the question, Kyle. Um, so those three uh, were chosen because those market masters and all of our market masters are volunteers we're willing to open. We have other market masters who will not open and who refuse to open until later in June. And um, it's a volunteer program. Uh, we are actually going to have to staff um, these three markets uh, to help ensure social distancing, proper social distancing, and help manage the market. Um, and we are also uh, coordinating with the police department. Sarah has been working extensively with them related to um, what opened today related to the community gardens and what we intend to open beginning on the 9th, which is the farmer's markets. A lot of that, frankly, is based on, again, PPE and resource availability. And frankly, in these situations, the willingness of the volunteer to put themselves in a situation that um, some of the other volunteers were not willing to. Ron Kendall. Ron, you're on mute. No, he's not. Yeah, I think we need to include the equity question uh, so that there's an explanation of how uh, the things we're doing fulfills that equity consideration that we say is so key to our mission. That was that was the, the prime consideration in looking at opening garden plots and farmers markets first. Because if we had gone with golf courses, it may have been the easiest way, but I can just imagine what the headlines would have been if we had opened golf courses first. So in, in sensitivity to that, that's why garden plots and farmers markets were selected first, strictly because of the equity issue. Mr. Chair, this is Kirk and Cannon. If I could also, uh, neglected to, address uh, Mr. Stone's question on SNAP. Staff is working uh, diligently right now to make sure that that happens uh, when we open up the farmer's markets. Any other comments or questions? I guess I've got an observation with regard to any comparison to what uh, the state might be doing. And you are? Uh, Jim Zook. <laughs> Uh, I'm still Jim Zook, I think. <laughs> anyway, uh, I think the state as well as the federal government have different uh, positions and uh, issues that they need to think about with regard to opening or not opening their parks. For example, uh, the state uh, may feel like it needs to be uh, consistent throughout the entire state. And there are many areas in the state that are certainly less populated than we are in Fairfax County. Um, and there may be other reasons why the federal government opens things up, perhaps prematurely. Uh, I, I, for one, am in accord with what I've heard um, the, the staff uh, uh, speak to with regard to the caution and care 
and consideration uh, that they're making with regard to any uh, decisions with regard to opening the parks or recommendations they might make to us. So I just want to echo uh, a concern that uh, I think we need to be very cautious with regard to how we proceed. Um, I think it's telling that, you know, once the, uh, the um, I guess the distancing factors uh, or we begin to open things up that we see an immediate drop of, I think someone mentioned 20% in people following the distancing. So I, I just think we need to, and I think the staff is um, considering all those issues with regard to their their uh, best advice as to when to open. Yes, Faisal. Do we have any update on how the schools are doing this and when, when are they planning to open the, the facilities? Mr. Chair, Kirk Kincannon, Executive Director, uh, we are in regular contact with the schools and um, we have no um, knowledge at this time or answer related to uh, when schools will open or frankly, if we will have access uh, to the schools for our normal operation of programs. That's one of the areas where we're just not sure. Um, they're not sure and we're not sure if, if uh, they're going to provide that. So, um, you know, again, at, they're, they're also help manage at the state level. So there are many things that, that are done school-wide uh, across the state. Faisal Khan here. So uh, uh, the reason I'm asking is because NCS manages both the fields and you know, all the facilities of Park Authority and the schools as well. So I mean, I, I mean, I just wanted to make sure that we are in sync with the public schools and see that how this is going and how NCS is, is basically taking this. Kirk and Cannon again. Um, so yes, we are in concert with the schools um, related to the fields. Um, that was actually a topic of discussion, I believe, the other night at uh, an athletic council meeting was better coordination from the school's perspective with us. Um, the, the action to close fields down by the schools was not communicated to us, nor I believe was it communicated to the athletic community at the time. Um, and so that did create quite an issue, uh, both for the athletic users as well as the park authority. All right, anybody else? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mike and Cindy, um, for the presentation. That was, that was interesting and informative for sure. Um, we have got uh, two other items, uh, countywide information item number two uh, was the FY 2020 second quarter budget review fund 10,001, the general fund, and countywide information item number three was the FY 2020 second quarter budget review fund 80,000, which is the revenue and operating fund. So that concludes the agenda uh, of the meeting. I'd like to uh, thank the staff and Kirk for uh, putting this together. I'd like, like to thank them for their support during this time i know it's been very very tough on everyone um, but pa patience is a virtue and i'm sure that we're going to need a lot of patience going forward but thank all of you for um for your voices for your input uh and for being uh the listening the listening folks out there in the field to let us know what's going on so uh, we will get through this in time and uh, certainly looking forward to when we can all get together and uh, and share again. So with that, uh, we are adjourned. On, everybody, two thumbs up for staff. Come on, everybody, two thumbs up for staff. All right. Thank you, Linwood. So with that, we are adjourned. Thanks again, folks. Be safe out there. Thank Stay you. inside in a vulnerable position. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Have a good night. Be safe. Good night. Thank you.